Journey of Honor was made possible through a generous donation from the 442nd Regimental Combat Team Foundation, honoring the legacy of Hawaii's Nisei veterans. A generous donation from Island Insurance Companies, providing auto, home, and business protection in Hawaii for over 60 years. Island Insurance, always there to help. With additional support from Club 100, a veterans organization. Veterans of the 100th Battalion, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, and their families. And from viewers like you. Thank you. I volunteered in March 41. I'm glad I did go. I had a, a duty to uh, get get into the service. I was trained uh, to to be a, a, an officer. Yeah. We had to prove to the nation that we can be trusted, and we're just as American as anybody else. We just felt, well, we have to do our duty. We just go to the wall front, that's all. It's like one of my buddies said, um, we may not have realized it, but we were, in a way, making history. <laughs> I don't think they went into the war to become heroes or to become glorified soldiers, and so that's not how I want to remember them as. What they gave me was really a sense that I need to be vigilant. I need to teach my kids to be vigilant and not take for granted a lot of the things that we have. The sense that democracy can be very fragile and that we as American citizens have to stand up for that. This is a story about honor. A story of legacies, of memory, and how we remember. It's also the story of a trip I took on the first spring of the new millennium. A journey where I learned about honor from a father I never knew. In 1995, my father died, a man I never really got to know. Our relationship, a casualty of alcoholism and divorce. So when I received a box of his things, some army ribbons, medals, a few photographs, mementos from the war, without history or context, I really didn't know what to do with them, or even what they meant or stood for. Five years later, I began work on a film about a group of World War II veterans from Hawaii who were returning to the battlefields of Italy nearly 60 years after the war. These men, now in their 80s, were some of the legendary Nisei soldiers of the 100th Battalion and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. 
For some, this would be their first trip back since the war. A time to honor old friends, relive those remarkable days, and pass on some of their legacy to their children and grandchildren. The Nisei soldiers were segregated combat units made up of second-generation Japanese-American men who distinguished themselves on battlefields in Italy, France, Germany, and the Pacific during World War II. They would go on to become among the most decorated units in the history of the United States Army. All this against the backdrop of discrimination and racial hysteria back home. Theirs is an incredible story that says as much about the absurdity of racism as it does on the meaning of honor, being an American and living and dying by your principles. All of you Americans of Japanese descent have a right to be proud today. You have demonstrated true Americanism and true American citizenship on the field of battle. America is proud of you. And I know that whatever future action you go into, you will conduct yourselves with glory and bring about the peace that we are entitled to. Good luck to you, and God bless you. It turns out my father, Masakichi, was a member of the 100th Battalion, Companies F and B, and part of that first group of men from Hawaii to ship out for training on the mainland, the war in Italy, and eventually, a place in history. Yeah, he's your father here. Probably uh, when he got drafted, yeah. I set out to talk with some men who served with my father. That's right. You know, they used to give big parties for the guys joining the army. Was that right? Sakai Takahashi was a captain and one of the commanding officers of my father's company. So I wouldn't know. This is a big island, yeah? Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, they yes. must. They, see, they're trying to dress them up and have them lined up, yeah? We were walking. Coming home, I went to the post office, pick up. There's an invitation from the United States government to be drafted. That's how it started now. I don't know what, how they went about it, but I was selected, one of the first ones. Charlie Nishimura was in the same company as my father. Both came from small plantation towns on the big island of Hawaii. There was quite a few, maybe about 50, I think. Mm -hmm. we, they're from all different plantations came together, you know, from maybe all the way from Hilo, Wainaku, and Onomea, and Hakalao. We all came together. Yeah, we were the same company, same company, but uh, he was in the fourth platoon. When, when we were drafted, we went to basic training in Schofield. We were the first, the first uh, draftee, sort of. So we just like opened the uh, you know, training camp over there. We were organized as a battalion, but uh, we had two extra companies strength because we have six companies. So they were called the Hawaiian Provisional Battalion. They didn't, they didn't know what to do with us. <laughs> just like a bastard outfit, you know. This your dad. This could be Mike Higa. I don't know, they, they, they really changed. Mm. This was New York. Yeah, so. It's a good memory, it's a wonderful memory for me. Seitoku Akamine also came from the Big Island and remembers my father from the war. Because it's the experience that we wouldn't have if we, if I didn't, like, you know, like I said, if I didn't go to a service. So we don't know where we were going. We don't know what we're going, we're going to be doing. But if uh, the military said we have to go, we have to go. Yeah. Wow. Naples. We used to drink from morning to night. We didn't have a chance to buy these kind of rings. My goodness. They get good collections, though. You better take good care of this, though. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, 
for the grandchildren of the 442nd Reverend Katsuko Miho for the three grandchildren. And also for the great grandchildren of the 442nd. Memory is a funny thing. It ebbs and flows, changing in color and intensity over time. But in a moment, a place, a sound, a familiar face will evoke our oldest and deepest memories. And although our actions define us, memory and legacy are the foundations of who we are. Now the kids ask me, you know, how was, so I tell them, see, and I, I send them the books that were written about the hundred and all that. Mm -hmm. But while they're growing up, no, no, no questions, no answers, right? So, so they don't know. They don't know what, uh, what we went through. Yeah. On the night before leaving for Europe, I found myself looking through my father's photographs one more time. This shot was taken on Hotel Street in Honolulu the night before my father shipped out. So many memories. So much history. And I began to realize how little I knew about any of it and how much history was missing from my own life. And so, the journey begins. Twelve Nisei veterans and their families will travel from Honolulu to Milan, Italy. We stop for a night in Los Angeles, and some of us take the opportunity to visit a memorial dedicated to World War II Nisei veterans. We all seem to be searching for something on this trip, and as I found my father among the many thousands of names along that curved granite wall, I began to feel a sense of connection. Because he stepped forward 60 years ago, I live in a better world. My father and the men I'm traveling with were part of something truly historic. And tomorrow, we begin our journey to relive some of those extraordinary times. Leading our group is Bob Jones, a journalist, former news anchor, and honorary member of the 100th Battalion. We gather for final instructions before leaving. This is that uh, some kind of museum, Uffizi Museum in Florence, Italy. Oh, and here's another picture of some of the guys that were on, uh, who were on the same pass in Italy, you know. capital of Lombardy, you know? Italy is divided into 20 regions, and now we are in Lombardy, in the north. Italy has an ever-present connection with its past. Everywhere you look, there are monuments and memorials of every kind. All share a simple purpose. Honor the past and inspire the future. Of all its monuments, none stand greater in stature or symbolism than Italy's great cathedrals. The second largest Gothic cathedral in the world is the Duomo in Milan. Generations of builders and worshippers have created one of Italy's greatest achievements. It is at once massive and intensely personal. It's difficult to imagine this cathedral or this beautiful city in the middle of war. But in 1944, Italians were marching against fascism 
as troops roll through its streets. So much is different now. And the war is about as far away from this generation as it could possibly be. But 55 years ago, some young men from Hawaii came through these parts and forever left their mark. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Got him. All present. All present. Accounted for. It's uh, kind of coincidental that it should be April when we come and make this trip because April was in fact the time when uh, the 100th and the 442nd were assigned uh, to assault that whole series of hills. I'm struck at how much those hills remind me of home. On a beautiful spring day, they could be the Waianae mountain range as easily as they are the Italian Alps. Certainly my father marched through those hills, and maybe even on these fields. It's impossible to imagine what it must have been like to be a young man from a small plantation town on the Big Island, to find himself out on these fields in the middle of a world gone crazy. If you ask those that were there if it reminded any of them of home, most will just shake their heads. No part of war could ever remind them of home. We're driving south along the Autostrada, which is the exact opposite direction the 100th originally marched. We've been on the bus for the better part of the day, and by the time we get to Pisa, we're all happy to stop and take in the sights. We settle in early for the night, because tomorrow, we'll be making one of the most important stops of our trip. It's Liberation Day, and townspeople from Pietra Santa have gathered to commemorate 55 years of liberation from fascism. It's a day filled with speeches, brass bands, and celebration. Nisei veterans have gathered from Hawaii and California in Pietra Santa to witness the unveiling of a statue honoring Allied soldiers who helped liberate this area during World War II. The statue is of Sadao Munimori, who died heroically in the hills above Pietro Santa. Munimori was the first Japanese-American soldier to receive the Medal of Honor. In all, Nisei soldiers were awarded more than 18,000 individual and unit citations, more than any other fighting unit in the history of the United States Army. Still, hero is a title most refused to accept. Far more important is their collective sense of honor and loyalty to their country. To all the dignitaries of Pietra Santa and the people of Pietra Santa and the vicinities, it is indeed a privilege and an honor to be with you today, Liberation Day. 55 years ago, you would never think that this day would happen. Your streets are gutted, homes are devastated, people were hungry and bewildered, bullets flying all over the battlefields and in your beloved mountains. So many of the young fellows of the 100th Battalion and 442nd Regimental Combat Team lost their lives, but some were fortunate to come home 
and they are back with you today as senior citizens. We have come a long ways from the middle of the Pacific Ocean, across continental United States, across the Atlantic Ocean, to Pietra Santa, and we are happy to be here. This memorial is a symbol of the sacrifices made by the Allied forces to bring freedom and liberty to your country. The torch is now passed to you, the living, the young, and the generations yet to be born. And may this statue always remind you of the high price of freedom and go forward with fortitude and endurance. God bless you all and thank you. Viva Italia! That night, the veterans are honored guests at a dinner hosted by the town of Pietrasanta. This has been a day when the veterans and their families have made a real connection with what the 100th and the 442nd accomplished for the people of this area. And with the statue of Sadao Munimori in place, it's a legacy that will be honored for many generations to come. We're on our way to Anzano and Montfolgarito. In classic Italian fashion, our hosts have rolled out the red carpet. A roadside meeting, a quick check with local police, and we're ready to roll. The people of this area remember the Nisei soldiers from the war and clearly hold them in high regard and with great fondness. <laughs> Um, we are going to go up the hill, Adzano, which is the area where many of your countrymen died, left their lives in order to free this country. And the hills across from you, the ones on, on your left side now, were actually part of the, uh, the tremendous theater that saw your countrymen give such a, a huge, important exceptional contribution to the liberation of Italy. In all, 103 Nisei soldiers died on those hills, including Saddam Munimori. Breaking through the heavily fortified German defense known as the Gothic Line was the final blow that liberated Italy from the Nazis. Listen, do you remember the year you were here then? Yeah, April 1945. The crack Italian Mountain Corps, known as the Alpini, are the most beloved group of veterans in all of Italy. They served as mountain guides and helped Allied troops navigate their way through the treacherous Alpi Apuane mountain range. And although they didn't share a common language, a shared experience brought these two groups together in a uniquely profound way. Some of the veterans began to talk about what happened during the war. Then they came from this way, and the other men from here, they attacked this way. Uh, were you here? Fighting? No, I got wounded in the uh, South Pearl. Where? Up on the hill. In what? what? In France. Ah, si, è lui rimasto so, ferito in Francia. Uh, uh, in Francia. This group. Ah, the, 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 this man we were talking before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We started from uh, Zano. Yeah. 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 This way, and where we so crossed over, I don't know. But you, you, you climbed to the top, didn't you? At one point in the action, I looked ahead. This was, remember, the whole thing took place in about only a half hour, okay? And this was earlier in that half hour, shortly after daylight. As I looked ahead, I could see one of our boys lying still over there. I knew he was dead. 
and I always wondered who it was. And I, well, I asked at that time, and um, I got no response. No one said anything. But there were only four killed that day in A Company, you know. And one of the others that was killed was right next to me. That you know, that made it very likely that it was what was there. And somehow, you know, because of things that happened there. I, I just wanted to go back and look at the spot. And... Stan Izumigawa came to honor his friend, Spud Munimori, who died a hero in the hills of Fall Garrido. The Alpini came to honor a debt of gratitude to the soldiers that helped liberate their towns and villages. On this bright spring morning, I began to understand what it meant to be in the midst of heroes. We left Mount Falgarito for lunch with the Alpinis in a place they call their hideout. There, we were treated to a wonderful Italian meal and learned firsthand why the Alpinis are so beloved in this country. The bond between these two groups of men went far beyond words. It was a common bond of honor, memory, and legacy.
la vita non ti lascio mai più. Finale. As we left the Alpinis, we were filled with a sense of wonder at what our fathers had accomplished. These ordinary men had given the world nothing less than hope, and in return, asked for nothing more than to be Americans. What I get from these guys is they don't want to be heroes, you know. They don't want to be the Japanese warriors, you know. They don't want to be the American samurais. The whole point that they're trying to make is that they're ordinary, regular Americans. You know, that, that whatever your race or color or the way you look, that there's a fundamental beingness of being an American. And that's what's, you know, that was what the, the country was supposed to be all about. You know, that's what we learn in history school. That's what they teach you. And we know from life experience that's not true. But the point these guys were trying to make is that it doesn't matter if we look Japanese. We're not. We're American. Americans come in all different sizes, shapes, and colors. I guess what I'm looking for is casino, you know, because that's sort of like um, the area my dad fought in. I'm glad I left to join the service. I volunteered in March 41. I'm glad I did go. We had a photo of him in, a, in his army outfit. But uh, as far as, you know, what did you do in the war, Daddy? And, Stuff like that. I think the only other thing I knew was that he got wounded in Casino, which was some place in Italy. And I didn't even know the significance of that until later on. And on my own, I started, you know, learning about World War II and what Casino was all about. You know, it's amazing when you ask the question, it comes out. But sometimes I have to think if what I'm saying is correct or is it the dates are wrong, or the time is wrong, things like that. But since I'm 81 years old, don't know that thing bother you. So I knew my father fought in the war, and he fought in Italy, and he fought with some other Hawaii guys. But the, uh, the significance of that, you know, um, where that started from, you know, I didn't know. I have no idea where it was. It's not a large river. People are surprised when they see the river. But Germans blocked it out and flood the area where we were going in. Minefields. That river was the Rapido River. And the battle, Monte Cassino. The bloodiest, most devastating battle the 100th would face in the entire Italian campaign. Yeah, he, he, he said the hundred came through that valley, and then they this was this river was sort of the boundary between the Germans on the other side and the American troops on the other side. The Battle of Casino, to me, that was the toughest battle I've ever been, and um, probably 
as tough as any other battle fought by American troops any time. You know, the Rapido River runs uh, east-west. It, it's a strong point because if, if the casino was taken and the Rapido River is crossed, the next object is Rome. Yeah? They, they, they chop down all of the trees, yeah? They demolished all of the houses, yeah? And so it was just a muddy quagmire. When we came here, it was winter, eh? In the mountains, it was all snow, you know. We reached here about, about, no, no, middle of January. It's the coldest time, I think. Yeah, middle of January to about the yeah, third week of February, so about five weeks. Actually, we didn't come this far. Okay. We were near the castle. The other side, but Baker Company may have come a little bit this side. The other side was flat. Eh? The Germans cut all the trees down. Eh? You know, had a few buildings. The Germans sort of loved the material over the mountain. We were on the reverse side. But the team passed us going to the flat area. Eh? You can see, oh, nighttime, man, just like fireworks. The monastery is like all the top. They could see it for miles and miles. No wonder we got smashed over there because you could see, the Germans could see right down our throat. Today, the monastery at Monte Cassino has been rebuilt and is a popular tourist attraction. Its pristine restoration and priceless art collection stands as a monument to hope and resurrection from a much darker time. You got hit twice. Did you get shrapnel or what happened? Probably if I didn't get hit on the second time, I'm so unlucky that I, I might step on a mine and like Major Johnson. Yeah, you're probably right. If you didn't get hit but, that way, maybe the next day you would have stepped on a mine. That's right. Maybe the next day I say, okay, the battalion move back, then go into the minefield, get I won't be here. That's, the, that's the life. Luck of the draw. Yeah. You better go back to the bus. I'll slate that to uh, Seitoku <laughs> Akami. <laughs> no, no, no. Many of the vets won't talk about the war. But you can be sure that for every wound and every casualty, there remains a lifelong memory. People that was not involved in war don't, do not realize how it is. I mean, you can, you can hear people say it. You can feel when the people say it, but it doesn't compare when you're actually in it and seeing your buddies, your friends die, get killed. Really. That morning we were going to casino. We were going out there marching forward. It was about five o'clock in the morning. It was pretty dark yet. Well, we were going forward, and this boy was in front of me. He, I know his name is Toshi Nakai from Papaiko. The family knew about me because when we were in Hiro training with the National Guard, I got friendly with that family. So I thought, well, I think I should tell them something about the brother. You know, I told them I was right there when your brother got killed. They stopped for a while. They couldn't talk. They came to me, they hold my hands. Tears in the eyes. That's how it goes. I thought about my father earning his Purple Heart and how something like that would change a man's life forever. The Secretary of War, Stimson there, and uh, Mark Clark there in the Jeep, yeah? And the General, general Ryder says, Mr. Secretary, this is my best troops. Patted me on the back and said, this is my best troops. I can hear him say that. I was so proud. 
I think they work well as a team because of their culture, you know. But I don't think that's why they excelled. I think they excelled because they had something to prove. It's interesting listening to the other guys. You know, it's interesting meeting the Italians and seeing their uh, appreciation and uh, you know what they think about it, you know how they feel about it. So th th that's re the really interesting part. A chance meeting with a man who lives in the area leads to an amazing scene. We need an interpreter. He has this bur Bridge yeah. of Love uh, by John Yeah, Oh, yeah, that's me. This okay. year. The book, Bridge of Love, tells the history and story of the Nisei soldiers and has photographs of all the Nisei troops that fought in the war. The vets take turns marking their pictures and signing their names. A chance meeting has turned into a moment of living history. Glenn, who's here in place of his ailing father, finds his father's picture in the book and makes a point of signing for him in a personal moment of honor. In another Italian village, another chance encounter leads to more memories. Perhaps we met. <laughs> I was a young boy at the time. And I still remember when the, 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 the front line passed through the, the village, I remember the bombing, the shelling by gun. And it, it uh, was uh, about uh, 20 hours shelling. And then suddenly everything stopped. And we, we exit because we were, uh, we went in the cave because we were, we were afraid and uh, in danger. And when I came out, I found uh, the, the, the American troops arriving and the German left. And I remember in the plane, there were many camps, many camps of the, of the army uh, where the, American group stay. Uh, so that's a, it's a very, very fresh remembrance for me because uh, at the time I, uh, we enjoy very much this happening uh, after the, the war, after the, 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 the German occupation, the arrival of uh, the American troops for, for was really a relief for us. Uh, and we we. We, we were able to fully understand the power of the American army and the richness, of the, the, the wealth of the <laughs> Because we are very, very, we, we, we are coming from a very, very sad uh, period of our history. So I, I wish to thank you again for your coming here and thank you for your memories. Thank you. Have a, have a nice day. And there were other encounters. Finding a wounded Nisei soldier in the forest, this man, Mr. Morganti, washed out the young soldier's wounds with wine and stayed with him until help could come. He's been searching for the young soldier ever since. He's the fellow that helped the lieutenant, the Nisei lieutenant, the head wound. I'm not exactly sure when it happened, but at some point, this trip began to take on a different quality. As we spent more and more time together, the facts of the war became far less important than just spending time together. These times were, in fact, becoming memories of their own. And I began to feel as though I were witnessing legacies being passed on before my very eyes. As I watched Bull Saito carry his granddaughter Jody on his shoulders, I wondered if this was the world he imagined back in 1945. And had our generation lived up to the great sacrifices of his.
Riding on the bus with the veterans and their families has been like traveling through time. We'd walked on battlefields together and stood before monuments erected in their honor. And that's made history come alive. But it's been in conversations and the simple telling of stories that a deeper understanding has emerged. In the personal accounts of the war, we found humanity. At times, we were left speechless at what these ordinary men had done and gone through. And we realized, once and for all, how important those stories are. Because without those stories, how will we remember? And without our conversations, what might we forget? I don't even remember how it came up. But then it finally came, and I don't think my father told me, I think my mother told me that it was because my father had this lieutenant, you know, who was German-American, and uh, he decided to name his son after him, and that's how I got the name. When I got pregnant with that baby, the first thing my husband told me is, if we have a son, his name is Kurt. We are so proud to have our son bear the name of Kurt Schirmer, and I hope our son will do just as well as Kurt Schirmer did in honor of our country, to bring peace and happiness to the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's a saying in Japanese, okage sama de. It means, I am what I am because of you. I think every one of us has come on this journey in search of what came before. Those things that give history and context to our identities and a larger meaning to who we are. I've been thinking about my father a lot on this trip. I've filled in some spaces of his life, and that's given me a longer view of my own identity. But best of all, I feel as though I've found a place for myself in history. I talked to a lot of guys about why they volunteered, and you hear all kinds of reasons. Some of them pretty flippant, but I know that deep down inside, uh, all, every one of them knew that they were on the spot, and they had to show their, their true colors. To me, the fact that there were over 700 white crosses with Japanese names, you know, at the end of the war. Uh, after that, you never heard anyone question or challenge the uh, loyalty of the Japanese. First of all, you have the obvious things like the history and the traditions, you know, the uniforms, the flags, the battle streamers. But to me, the most important thing is the go for broke attitude, like the motivation, the self-sacrifice, the willingness to keep on going against odds, perseverance. That's the most important thing that they left to us, to me. They showed us what it means to be an American. It's not just taking advantage of the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, but it's really standing up for it and standing up for yourselves as Americans. They are very reluctant to talk about the, the painful things. Um, they either don't want to think about it or they don't want us mm -hmm. to know. But I think we have to know. You know, like Spock Matsunaga always used to say, you know, you gotta 
keep on repeating, let the world know this is what happened. I never talked to my father about the war or about much of anything else. He was absent from most of my life and for reasons I'm sure I'll never fully understand. But I've been thinking about the box. Six years after I first opened it, I think I understand its significance. No matter what he did or didn't do with the rest of his life, there was a time he stepped forward when duty called and risked everything in the name of honor and obligation. And I'm guessing this was the person he always intended to be. I can't remember the sound of his voice, and I have more questions now than ever. But some heroes from the war have helped me to better understand my father by showing me that honor can be found in a single deed. The generation of my fathers has left a great and noble legacy. And now, the future rests in our hands. This memorial is a symbol of the sacrifices made by the Allied forces to bring freedom and liberty to your country. The torch is now passed to you, the living, the young, and the generations yet to be born. And may this statue always remind you of the high price of freedom and go forward with fortitude and endurance. Mm -hmm.